Hello, uh, my name is Emily McCarran. I'm the upper school principal at the Punahou School in Honolulu, Hawaii, and going to chat with you a bit today about our um, after school language and immersion, language and culture immersion programs in the elementary school, which started a couple of years ago. Um, first of all, just want to thank the incredible sponsors of this uh, conference, acknowledge them. Um, and just to orient you a little bit to our school, we are a K-12 independent school located in Honolulu, Hawaii. The sort of green that you see at the front of this screen is our campus, um, so we're right in urban Honolulu. Um, we were founded 175 years ago this year. We're celebrating a big birthday. Um, we have just over, over 3,700 students. Um, our admissions is need blind. Um, so financial aid is, uh, hi Lucy. Um, hi. Financial aid is um, available to every student who applies. So a student's ability to, to attend Punahou is, oh, let me just say hello. Hi Lucy. Hi Lucy, I'm recording. <laughs> Sorry. Um, to an empty room, but thank you for being here. Um, so our uh, community represents the really uh, rich ethnic and cultural diversity of Honolulu um, and Hawaii. So we have a high level of ethnic and cultural diversity, probably much higher than most independent schools in the U.S. Um, another unique feature of our schools is that we are sort of geographically in the center of the Asia-Pacific Asia region. So we have lots of opportunities for um, connections and partnerships with schools in Asia. The school has had, uh, for a long time, a uh, focus on global citizenship. In the early 90s, the Woe International Center, which is the sort of arm of the school, was founded uh, to support our global partnerships to run uh, travel and study abroad programs for both for teachers and students. And this part of the school supports uh, global education for our own students and also for the community. There's a lot of our programs which are open to the public. Um, we have uh, summer pro courses. We have um, year-long study abroad programs that we facilitate. Uh, and then we also have um, on-campus programs for both students and teachers uh, from other parts of the world. So it was in that context that we began uh, discussions about an after-school immersion program in language and culture. For about 20 years, we've had sort of after-school language classes, and we also, which are about once a week. And we also um, have had after school sort of supplementary classes in um, French, Spanish, Mandarin, Chinese, and Japanese for a number of years. And um, a few years ago, we started surveying parents and asking them what their aspirations for those courses were. And of course, they were that their um, children develop working fluency um, in those languages, which is not likely to happen with a once a week program. So with that, we started creating a framework for an after-school care type model. Um, we really wanted to focus on having um, having kids be not in sort of class after school, but uh, in a play-based environment. So we recognize that there's a lot of students on campus. School day ends at 2.30 for most of our youngest kids, and many of them are staying on campus until 5 or 5.30 when their parents are able to get done with work and pick them up. So they're in after school care or in a number of other programs. So what we decided was to take advantage of that 15 hours a week, really, from 2.30 to 5.30 every day and create play-based um, language and culture immersion. So the way we describe it is language and culture acquisition in a fun, playful, and active environment. So again, these aren't kids um, sitting in uh, classrooms or being drilled on or grammatical structures, these are kids playing and using the language to play. Um, there's some discussions about whether you could call this immersion because um, immersion, of course, is dual language immersion is when you are learning content in the target language. And But for these after school programs, the content is really play. So kids are learning how to play board games, they're having to figure out how to get their snacks, they're having to figure out how to go to the bathroom and ask for help. and um, do all the things that you might do in a, in a robust after-school care program, but they're doing it in the target language. So in the first year, we started um, the program with a pilot program in Mandarin. I'm sorry, this slide got a little messed up in the transition here. Um, so that was in 2013-14. Uh, 
Um, we were in that program. We had kindergartners through sixth graders in a um, after school care environment. Um, that was hard. We learned a lot of lessons. First of all, that having we were really committed to having multi age group, but having K six and having a brand new program that was um, a lot. So in 2015-16, um, we scaled back to uh, just K through three, but we also added um, a Japanese and Hawaiian. So in the second year, we had three languages going, um, and we kept going with Mandarin K6, but then we realized in our third year that it would be good to scale that back. Um, so currently, this is this year, um, we have three programs running K through three, and next year, we're going to move the Japanese up to K4. So there's super high demand for these um, courses. They're fee-based after-school programs. Um, and they're full every year. We could have them a lot. Um, we could have more, probably. We picked these languages because these are the languages most in demand in our community. Um, surprisingly, Spanish, which is a huge demand and has lots of dual language and immersion programs in the rest of the country, is not as prevalent in Hawaii. So um, Mandarin and Japanese are the languages which um, most commonly spoken um, in our community. So some of the things that were um, difficult or lessons that we learned about the program is that staffing of these programs is really hard. What we were asking um, faculty to do was create a basically a really robust immersion um, school, but after school hours and with after school care pay, which is really different than faculty pay. So that's um, something we're still working on. Also, um, we learned that collaboration with other departments. So other, we have a lot of after school programs running. So working carefully with the folks who are doing um, after school care, who are doing um, music and um, and all of the other classes, karate, sports, swimming, all that stuff. So collaborating with them and making sure that we were all sort of in touch and, and caring for the kids um, collaboratively. Also, we spent a lot of time um, the first couple of years sort of trying to mediate the expectations of parents. Um, we were really clear we would run parent orientations and say, you know, this is not a language school. This is not going to be drilling in the grammar. This is going to be kids playing. And so it's likely that kids will come home to you and say, you know, if you say, what do you learn? They're going to say nothing. We just played. And that's the purpose. Um, so even with that sort of prepping of all of the of the um, families, we still found that some parents wanted an experience for their kids or expected that the experience would look more like their own language class experience, which, of course, we really didn't want it to um, because we know that's not super effective, especially for little kids. So just sort of continuing to manage those expectations is an ongoing uh, opportunity for us. Um, we also found in the first couple of years, we allowed kids to participate in other co-curricular activities. So after school activities, kids might have a dance class and a music class. And we would actually, our program would walk them to that class and then walk them back to the immersion, um, which has created these incredibly complex schedules. Um, and just the staffing of those was also really hard. So. What we've done this year is we've said that you can participate in the immersion program, but we're not going to be moving you around to other um, to other classes, which has helped us create a little bit more consistency. It also decreased our enrollment a little bit because we were a full service sort of nanny program because um, we were worried about uh, interest, but we have enough interest that we don't need to be doing that. And it's actually better for the kids to have more contact time um, in the program. A couple of things that have worked really well in the program um, is that we've, since the beginning, we've included high school students, so which we call our 9 through 12 the academy. We've included academy students as teaching assistants in the program. So what that's provided is a really robust, authentic experience for our high school kids to um, communicate in the language. And in the first year, what we found was that some of our best language students at the high school level were not particularly well suited to work with little kids. They were folks who were um, really precise in their language use. Um, 
a little bit afraid to make mistakes. Um, and so working with a kid and having to come up with things like, uh, you know, put the toilet seat up, or are you hungry for your snack now, or how come you put your shoes um, on your head, or, you know, things that you might have to say to the little to five-year-olds when you're working with them. Those aren't things that are sort of traditionally taught in the high school language classroom. So we found that a lot of the kids who were the best TAs were kids who um, were not necessarily the best language students, which is great because it created a more another authentic opportunity for kids to develop their language and culture skills, um, again, with an authentic audience and with a real purpose. Uh, we also have the fortune, good fortune of having a number of heritage language speakers, um, more in Japanese than in Mandarin, but um, some in Mandarin also, who are able, um, kids who speak uh, the language at home with one or more parents. Um, so we do have a pretty high level of competency in our high school population, which allows this to work out. Um, another really important success is that kids' proficiency is really progressing. So we are seeing um, good levels of proficiency in our kids who have been in the program for um, one to three years. We're developing still um, sort of assessment tools. Uh, we've gone back and forth with different tools. We're using the actual, but it's uh, not super effective for uh, early um, elementary uh, assessment. So we're sort of using combination of can-do statements um, and some in-house made things to assess program development over time. Uh, another success is really high demand for the program, high interest. Uh, and then also a, an important success has been that um, it really, the presence of this program has forced the movement of the K-12 conversation around outcomes for language and cultural learning particularly because what we're finding here and what we're anticipating in the near future is that a lot of our students who are in this after-school immersion program are going to enter our middle school language courses over-prepared for, over -prepared for the courses we offer. So um, given that we don't think it's likely we'll be able to say to families, okay, you've been in this immersion program now, we don't have a class for you in that language, um, we're probably going to have to make some, uh, some shifts in what we offer in the middle and high school in order to create more sort of heritage-like courses um, for the students who have been in these programs, which is great. Um, I have a couple of videos of um, stuff going on in the classes. So I will just, uh, I think when you um, are watching the videos, you'll be able, whoops, I'm having trouble typing in the chat box here. Oh. Um, just a sec. I'll use the web tour button. Thanks. I'll go ahead and do that. Um, pardon me while I type this in. The first, um, uh, the first video is, um, so this is one of our academy students working with uh, one of the um, the kindergartners in the first year of the program. So we'll just watch it and then we'll talk a little bit about it. Um, so what you can see there, uh, go back, is, well, I don't know, um, do you, hi, Joy, um, Lucy or Joy, do you guys have any comments about what you saw there? Hi, I'm going to the mic really quickly. Um, so glad to have you here. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, I guess I, I love the idea of Thanks. pairing high school students with this, you know, with the younger students. And 
any any feedback from the the kids who've worked in the program about you know working in this immersion program? Yeah, they love it. I mean, we've seen um, we have lots of applicants for the program, and we've started being uh, have, being a little bit more rigorous about what uh, the process by which we accept kids to work in the program. Um, what the, the kids have noticed, the high school kids have noticed, is that their fluency increases as much as the elementary school kids. So just to be speaking um, and interacting in the language for another two or three hours a day, depending on how long their shift is, is a huge benefit, even if it's around really basic things, like this um, high school kid is helping this little girl count. And um, what you can and, and do some drawings. And what you can see is the, the girl is not creating any output, which of course is the ultimate goal. But her input, her understanding of what the the TA is saying is actually really, really strong. And you can hear in the, the video the how loud the classroom environment is. I mean, there's kids running around and they're screaming. But because the ratio of um, TAs and, and little kids is really um, small, there's a, there's a really high ratio of t adults to, well, high school kids and, and adults to little kids, um, that there's a lot more sort of one-on-one -on -one interaction, whereas in a uh, sort of traditional classroom, it might be one teacher and maybe 15 or 20 kids, but here we have like 60 kids and maybe 20, um, depending on the day, you know, 15 to 20 adults floating around. So kids, they all. And really it seems like, it. like a really creative use of scheduling issues too for schools to try something like this because if you can't fit in longer periods of time around language during the school day, you know, making the most of the after school. Yeah. Yeah, because every there's always lots of after school time that we think if we don't have. Um, I'm going to put in okay. another Seems video really here. Smart, and it's not Do you have any questions? You it doesn't look like it's direct instruction. It's more individualized and more play based. And from what I'm yeah. observing, um, and it just seems like more natural use of the language too. Yes, for sure. Um, definitely, lots more natural use. Uh, let me see if I can. Oh, this is a. Um, I have another video here. It's not going to let me. Um, I don't know why it doesn't let me paste in there. Oh, okay. Hold on. Um, this is a video of our Hawaiian program. Um, so this is. So that's a, um, you know, obviously hide and seek. So they created sort of like a chant that's, you know, the counting to 10 and then makoko at the end. That means like, are you ready? And that's actually a really common um, phrase in sort of Hawaiian classrooms or in any classroom. Like, okay, everybody ready? Are we all here? Are we ready? So the kids are learning that critical sort of classroom vocabulary by doing things that they want to do, which is play hide and go seek and hang out. Um, Joy, since you're here, do you want to just, uh, pop on the microphone or in the chat box and say where you're coming from and 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 who you are. Why not? That's okay too. Um, I have one more video to show you guys. Um, this is from the Japanese class. So we have the three um, languages. Let's see. Um, sorry. So the Japanese one, this is a, a video of some, again, some TAs playing with, uh, with the younger kids. <laughs> My favorite part about this video is you can see um, over in the background the girl who's just sort of in the fetal position um, and 
you know, sometimes in particularly in after school programs, kids just need to rest. So um, really tending to all their needs, but we can listen a little more as they talk about the food. So again, the um, you know the fun thing is to really that all the kids get to play. They get to be with each other. They get to um, be doing things they want to do, but they're doing it in the language. Um, any questions about the videos at this? Point. Awesome. Thanks, Lucy. So uh, a couple of things, you know, I think some future opportunities, obviously, we, we would really love to figure out how to do a better job integrating these um, experiences into the sort of academic day. We have um, once or twice a week uh, language instruction in the elementary school. So, uh, and what we'd like to do is have the people who are doing those programs also uh, connect with or be the same people who are doing the after school programs to create sort of more overlap. So, if a teacher who's working with maybe a whole grade level gets to know a subset of those kids who are in the immersion program, then you can leverage their competencies to sort of support the learning of the rest of the kids in the, in the full uh, grade level, um, creating little uh, leadership opportunities. Um, also, I think we really have a lot of work to do around creating um, can-do statements for program and individual student evaluation. Parents, of course, want to know um, how their kids are progressing in, in their development in the language and um, language more than culture, um, usually. But um, so to have a really clear sense of that, so after a year in the program, it'll look sort of like this. The kids will be able to do this. After two years, they'll be able to do this. Um, we've created sort of a Every year we've had a little bit of a different version of a kind of spiraling curriculum because we want the kids, it's a repeatable program obviously, um, and we don't want to have different sort of curricula for the different grade levels. Uh, and we want the kids with more competency to be interacting with and supporting the learning of the kids with lower competencies. Um, but that's a really, again, that's a really super hard curriculum design challenge, um, particularly for people who are just working a few hours a day at this and usually after another full-time job. Um, another cool, we think, opportunity for the future is the WO International Center at Pernho. We've always um, been involved in creating student travel and learning opportunities. And uh, this is actually a picture of my daughter. Last year, we traveled with the um, middle school students to uh, a, one of our partner schools in China, and she sort of got to come along for the ride. But um, it'd be really great to create more opportunities for family travel trips that are sort of educationally based. And, and given the rich sort of network of partner schools that we have, um, it, there'd be lots of fun opportunity to do that. And I think we sort of assume that um, middle school is when kids can begin traveling, but if they go with their parents, they certainly can begin much younger than that. We've also um, been challenged by some of our partner schools in Japan, actually, to send kids traveling as early as second grade. Um, and we've had some fourth graders travel here for an exchange program, so we're going to send um, from fourth and fifth graders to Japan, but we're sort of pushing down the, um, the barrier of when we're able to send kids abroad. Um, any questions about any of those future opportunities? Or any stories about other places that are doing things like that? Okay. Um, well, since we're such a teeny audience, that's um, pretty much the content of what I had um, built to share. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you folks have and also uh, engage in conversation in the future around um, every, anybody who's doing this kind of work. Um, yeah, thank you for that. No, it's really, there isn't a lot of, traveling with little kids is, is, people think that that's not a reasonable thing, but it's actually a great thing to have sort of family, um, group of families traveling together. And we do a lot of that actually in the, in the high school. We have, um, Mostly in our music program, our symphony and our band um, have often traveled, and then we allow tag along. They sort of have to be in separate from their kids in some ways, but um, it creates really neat family opportunities. And so there's, I, I think it'd be there would be lots of cool reasons to do that. Um, I think you're right. Many schools are scared of parents. The idea of traveling with parents 
is actually way harder than traveling with kids. <laughs> and what we found is you really have to have clear guidelines. Um, especially traveling with little kids, you'd have to make sure that, you know, parents understood that the kid was their responsibility, <laughs> um, but that we, you create an environment. But even if you did, like what we were thinking about was having, you know, you could do easily a week in Beijing or Shanghai, and where that's what we were thinking about, where we have an, a number of partner schools, and the kids could actually go to school for the day with teachers who are sort of on site there, and then the parents go out and do sightseeing or touring, and then they get together at night and maybe go to shows or um, concerts or some museums. So anyway, that would be fun to figure out how to do. For future directions, Unless there are any other questions, I will stop the recording, but look forward to being in touch if anyone wants to chat about this or um, or I'd love to hear also about what other schools are doing in this realm. Mahalo, thanks so much.